Hey guys, welcome to BP, the Bible perspective on salvation in death, the legal and vital description. Now, before we get into it, please like and share this video and subscribe to BP, the Bible perspective. And as always, if you have a thought or comment, add it to the comment section below. All comments are welcome. This is part 16 of our in-depth teaching on the subject of salvation. Now, if you were uh, remember a while ago, um, <clears throat> we, I said that part of the motivation was many, many years ago, I saw this billboard, it was a billboard, and it was just like that, um, black letters against a white background, and that's all it said, saved from what? It was no scripture, no who wrote it, no, uh, well, anyone. And at first I thought it's odd, and I, an odd question. And then I also thought, well, maybe Christians just kind of put forth the question. Over the years, I'm thinking, well, maybe atheists do it. I do get a lot of <clears throat> questions from atheists, um, those who, dis, who are atheists because they have deconstructed from Christianity. <coughs> Excuse me. So they asked the question, say, from what? Now, it is a good question. And so the other motivation for me doing this in-depth Bible studies, because, I mean, a study on salvation, is that, <coughs> oh, excuse me. <coughs> Hold on. <coughs> the other reason is we... um. I do a lot of response videos, reaction videos, and from pretty much any subject on the various viewpoints on salvation. So whether it's water baptism, holiness, living right, living holy in order to be saved, um, once saved, always saved bait, and those arguing against those who do not believe that once you're saved, you're always saved. And then there's even Calvinism. Calvinism is a different thought because they believe God sovereignly chooses some to be saved while sovereignly chooses the rest, <coughs> excuse me, uh, for eternal damnation. What they all have in common is that they usually string verses together. They frame their theology from verses of scripture, not taken from passages that teach on the subject of salvation. And that always amazes me. <clears throat> that how would you have an opinion? How would you present an argument without ever talking about John 5, 24? So I'm always amazed at that. I'm going to show that in a moment. So this is why I said, well, let me let me just do an in-depth study solely and plainly on the subject of salvation. And that's what we've been doing. In the first section, we talked about why we needed to be saved. That's extremely important because all of the other doctrines where they tell you that you have to get baptized in water, why they tell you you have to live right, you have to do good things deeds. Catholicism says good deeds mixed with faith. All of that, the problem is one thing, is that when Adam ate from the tree that God commanded him not to eat, he died. And when he died, <clears throat> mankind died with him, even though they have not yet been born. But so as a result, every human being is born dead, born, cut off, alienated from God, okay? And so we have been existing. So the, it, it is futile, futile to think just good works because if you just only do good works, you're still dead in sin. Now that brings us then to this next phase because I want to talk about the vital and the legal description of our salvation. 
This is another reason why these other ideologies, these other viewpoints where they err because they 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 don't get into why did why did why are we legally saved? Now I'm gonna say something that there is a particular big box department store. Now get this, they always check your receipts when you go out. I never show them my receipts. And the reason why is because I legally own the merchandise. It is my merchandise. I purchase it. Now I keep the receipt in my pocket, but I never show. Them. It's mine. And I can stand bold like that because I have a legal document saying it is mine. That's just an example, okay? Legally, when I tell people that I know that I know that I know I'm going to heaven, I know that I know that I'm safe, it's because I have a legal document. Now, the other side of this is the vital side of our salvation. And I always, I often ask, what is the effect of what Jesus did? What is the effect of it? And that's extremely important. And the Bible tells us that right now we are the children of God. What does that mean? When we say that we're born again, what does that mean? See, that's the vital side, this, that living vitality, the living, you know, um, you know, when, it, when we talked about the vitals, the, 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 the organs, the living organs, right? And so there's both a legal side and a vital side to our salvation. And for the life of me, I cannot understand why pastors are not really teaching this. Because God is quite plain and simple on this. So here's a verse that I like to always use. I love this verse. This is John 5, 24, when he says, I assure you. And right off that first statement there, I assure you. This is an assurance from Jesus. Anyone who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. It will not come under judgment, but it's passed from death into life. And so in this statement here, Besides the incredible assurance that Jesus gives us, he says, if you hear and believe, hear the word and believe, notice he says, you have eternal life. You're not going to accumulate eternal life. You're not going to work on it. You're not going to earn it. You're not going to earn points for it. But you already have it. That's the vital side. The other part of the vital side is you pass from death to life. And that is a problem because we need to understand, remember our first few videos where we talked about why man is dead in sin. And let me just do my thing here. Remember my whole video here? Here are the plant. All of the branches here are plugged into this life source. And so just for our illustration here, if this represents God, when Adam sinned, remember, he was alienated from God. He was cut off. And then he began to exist apart from God. This is the problem of salvation, why you cannot just do enough good deeds. If you did all the good deeds, even though you can't, but if you did all the good deeds, you still would be dead in your sin. And so Jesus reconciles us back to God, okay? So, um, so with this verse, it kind of gives us an overview, the vital side and the legal side. The legal side here is, and will not come under judgment. Why can I walk around? And Jesus said, I assure you, you won't come under judgment. But we walk around with the assurance. The only way you can have that assurance is that legally something had to have happened. Now, before we get into this, I also want to remind you of the other incredible promise of why Jesus 
did this. Let me see if I can find this verse right quick. Well, you know what? Let's go to the verses. Let's go to the scriptures here. Okay. So let me just show you again uh, why. Let's look at John. John chapter 3. I just want to read John chapter 3 uh, and verse 16. John chapter 3 verse 16. It says, For God loved the world in this way. He gave his one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in him would not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world that he might condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Anyone who believes in him is not condemned, so that's my legal side, but anyone who does not believe is already condemned because he has not believed in the name of the one and only Son of God. So notice this, he, God loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whosoever believeth in him will not perish but have eternal life. So right here we see the, again, vital and the legal uh, in terms of salvation, why we're saved. But I also want to leave us with this thought, and that is for God love. And he did this because of love. And there's another <laughs> I mean there was another verse in Galatians that tells us that circumcision doesn't mean anything, no uncircumcision. And that would be the old testament representing the old testament law. But he says, but faith would work is by love. In other words, my faith is not based upon condemnation, but my faith is based upon and motivated by that God loved me enough to give the very best he could, which is his son, Jesus Christ. Now let's look at another verse of scripture, Colossians chapter 1, Colossians Chapter 1, you have heard me preach this many times. It is an awesome verse. Excuse me. <coughs> oh, I don't know why I got this cough here. Now, verse 21 says, Once you were alienated and hostile in your minds because of your evil actions, but now he has reconciled you by his physical body through his death to present you holy, faultless and blameless before him. Now, I want you to get that. He has reconciled you. We were alienated. Remember we said through Adam, as in Adam, all die. So once you were alienated and hostile in your minds because of your evil actions, but now he has reconciled you. Notice he has reconciled you by his physical body through his death. To present you holy, faultless, and blameless before him. So why am I so assured of my salvation? This is why. Because he, through his physical body, through his death, presented me holy, faultless, and blameless before God. Now let's kind of go back and look at this. Because I want to look at the legal side of our salvation. Okay, and then I want to talk about the vital side. But I want to I want you to see the legal side. So let me go to Romans chapter three. Again, I, I I'm utterly amazed that a discussion or debate on salvation that you will not come to this passage here. So um, Romans 3, um, I'll pick it up at verse 9, and Paul says, but then are we, are we any better? Not at all, for we have previously charged that both Jews and Gentiles are all under sin. So this is the starting point in reference to us. 
You start off, we're all under sin. And again, we talked about that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay. That happened because when Adam ate from the tree, he spiritually died. He was spiritually cut off from God. And he said, as it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. All alike have become useless. There is no one who does what is good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They deceive with their tongues. Viper's venom is under their lips. Their mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and wretchedness are in their paths. And the path of peace they have not known. There is no fear before their God. I mean, for, before their eyes. Now, there is no fear of God before their eyes. Now, this is kind of a, where, where Paul pulls together several scriptures from Proverbs and Psalms. And what this kind of does is gives us how God views us. That's in, in, important. I was say, with all of these, you know, discussions that you can have and debates on salvation, that's why usually my question is, what sin do you think is good enough? Now, people will say that you that there are people who actually teach that Christians don't sin ever. Again, delusional, but okay, they're out there. And they're, they're out there more than you think. But to those who think, if I have to do some kind of work, some kind of good deed, then my question is, well, how good do you have to be? Because the problem with that, <clears throat> excuse me, the problem with that is they're not understanding how God views sin. And this is a good, in a nutshell. And what we have to understand is that in God's view, you start off with, he is perfect. He is perfect. And then anything less than perfect is unacceptable. Anything less than, than, than perfection is rejected. So you start off with a holy, just God, and then anything less than that is automatically then unacceptable to God. So the only way that you could think that your good deeds could ever be acceptable before God is you are deceived. You are delusional. You're not paying attention. Okay, so let's take a look at... Um, let me go to... I want to go to Galatians. A couple of verses I want to go to with Galatians. You know what? Let me stop off at um, Ezekiel first. Um, Ezekiel 33. Um, this is going to be, hang on to this one here. Um, uh, let's pick it up at verse 11. Let's pick it up at verse 11. Uh, let's see here, verse 11. Okay. All right, here we go. All right, so I'm going to pick it up at verse 11. And then he says, uh, Tell them, as I live, declare uh, the declaration of the Lord God, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that the wicked person should turn from his ways and live. Repent, repent of your evil ways. Why will you die, house of Israel? Now, son of man, say to your people, the righteousness 
of a righteous person will not save him on the day of his transgression. Neither will the wickedness of a wicked person cause him to stumble on the day he turns from his wickedness. The righteous person won't be able to survive by his righteousness on the day he sins. Now I tell a righteous person that he will surely live, but he trusts in his righteousness and commits iniquity, then none of the righteousness will be remembered. And he will die because of his iniquity that he has committed. Now, he goes on and says this and kind of emphasizes this even more. And what's interesting about this, if you want to live by the law, and remember he said that the law represents the commands, the precepts of God's justice of God's holiness, living right, okay? Now, the, the, the problem with religion is their warped vision of what they think is then doing good deeds. And even though they may say, I'm not going to live, we're not doing good works, we're not living by good works, that's exactly what they're doing. So, so whether it's, you know, um, again, uh, all the different doctrines, okay, that do not believe that you are saved by grace, okay? In fact, I, 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 I'm doing videos now on a, <laughs> um, the once saved, always saved debate. And basically, you have these scholars, these, these apologists basically saying, that you're not guaranteed that you're going to go to heaven. You must live good enough until you die. And then when you die, you kind of hope that you make it in. Now, as we read, Jesus said, I assure you, they don't. The problem, of course, is if you're going to go that route to say that now I have to live good enough, I have to do enough good deeds, I have to live holy enough. Or one, can you, <clears throat> can you, and can, can you ever meet God's standards? <clears throat> right? Can you ever meet God's standards? Well, right here is one of God's standards. Where he says, if you do all this righteousness and you hum it along very good, and then the day you sin, all of that righteousness is wiped away. It's gone. All It's wiped away. This is righteousness according to the law. Now, you may say that's unfair. Right? It's unfair. He also throws this in, that if a person repents, then all of the wickedness that he has done also will be wiped out. So the person now who said, I've been doing all of this goodness, and then this person who is wicked come along, he can have his... Is his, his wickedness wiped away? You may say, this is unfair, God. No, it's not. You see, the law was never designed to give life. That's the first thing. And secondly, the idea of the law was not given to the righteous man anyway. The law was given to the unrighteous man for the very fact that we have the law demonstrates we're unrighteous. See, the idea is that first and foremost, you could not ever be good enough because of your sin nature. Okay, let's look at it from another point. I wanted to show you that because it, it, it is always amazing how people just kind of overlook these verses here, these passages, and not say, well, God, what, what do you think about this? So, um, uh, look at verse 10. I want you to see something. Look at verse 10. This is Galatians chapter 3, verse 10. For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse, because it is written, everyone who does not continue doing everything written in the book of the law is cursed. So in other words, if you don't continue 
doing everything, he says, you're cursed. So the high standard of God is unachievable for sinful man. So you're deluding yourself to say, let me attempt to do this instead of, look at, the, look, look at verse 11. Now, it is clear that no one is justified before God by the law because the righteousness will live by faith. Now, we go on, we'll probably come back to this at another time. But let's go back to Romans 3. So this picture here, when he says, all are under sin. Why? This is God's view. All are under sin. We're all under sin. We're we start off with, we are guilty before God. So now, one, we could never plead our case because we're guilty. We walk in, guilty. Before you open your mouth, guilty. God is not even asking us how do we plead. You know, when you go to court, the judge will ask, how do you plead? Not guilty, Your Honor, right? Even if you are guilty, even if you're caught red-handed, you're still going to say, not guilty. Anyway, any wise people were, not guilty. Well, God doesn't even give you that chance. You're guilty. And you start with your guilt. You start with the fact that you're dead in sin. You start with the fact that you can never be acceptable to God simply because you're dead in sin. And the way God looks at this, that you, because you're dead in sin, you are always capable of sin. Now, let's say, and this, this kind of happens all the time. Come on, this for a moment. This, this happens often. Sometimes, let's say you have a person who grows up in God's country, the middle town, small town, where everybody knows your name. You know, no one locks the doors. Everybody's nice. You grow up, you go to church on Sundays maybe tip out a little on Saturday, but pretty much everybody, you know, is nice and kind. Crime is non-existent. By the way, there are places that really exist like that. Then, uh, except for this, I'll say this, that um, with the advent of the internet, sin is multiplying because you, 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 it, it used to be you would have to go outside the confines of that safety, you know, going to school, moving to a big city for a job, going to the military. Then you're exposed. And the interesting thing is that always when you expose man, his sin nature is going to come out. And sometimes you don't know that until you are exposed. Right? Now, Theoretically, you can take a person who then grew up in a sinful environment and then it'd be like that movie Castaway. Well, all of a sudden he's stranded on an island for five years. Right? He's not going to sin because there's nothing around him. There's no internet. There's no, if he's the only person, right? There's none, no one to lust after. No drunkenness, no alcohol or whatever, no drugs or whatever, no violence because he's the only one. So then all of a sudden you can say he lives a pretty good life because he's not sinning. But remember, to God, he's dead in sin. He's dead in sin. And then all of a sudden he gets rescued. And guess what? When you reintroduce him back into society, the sin nature is stirred. The sin nature is stirred. Um, let me go to one more scripture here. And that is... Let's go to Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 2. Look at this, Ephesians chapter 2. And you, he says, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you previously walked according to the ways of this world, according to the ruler who exercised authority, over the lower heavens, the spirit now working in the disobedient. We too also, I mean, we too all, we too all previously lived among them 
in our fleshly desires, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and thoughts, and were by nature children under wrath, as the others were also. All right, so again, remember, we start off dead in sin. This, this is the starting point. And if you say that, um, well, I'm, I'm not that bad, you're calling God a liar. You're not recognizing God's view. And his view, by the way, is the only one that counts. You know, sometimes people will measure themselves by their good deeds. I'm not a bad person. I help old ladies across the street. I don't cheat on my taxes. You know, I clean up my mess. I drive under the speed limit. And, um, but yet you still are failing to realize the sins that you will do. And all of this, I'm giving you a good example. Because one, you know the one sin people never talk about? Never. Ever. Racism. And yet every denomination split over the issue of slavery and Jim Crow. They split. It was actual, there were some who said, you know this is wrong. Others said, ah, no. God wants us separate, right? want the races separate. And yet, they don't see that as sin. Even to this present day, you see racism rampant in churches among certain people. They know about it. You know about it. Come on, you know about it. But we won't call it sin. Now, just because you don't call it sin doesn't mean God doesn't call it sin because how are you going to hate? How are you going to discriminate against your so-called Christian brothers? I say so-called because if you say, and by the way, entire denominations felt this way, that they want practices that it is against God's will for whites and blacks to mix together. They taught and practice it. Not only did they teach and practice it, but in many cases, their change did not come to like 30 years after the passage of the 1964-65 Civil Rights Bill. The churches kept in it, these Christian colleges. Were they saved? Do you think God is looking at them saying, and they had, and some of these schools had strict behavior, strict rules. Women need to wear pants, jewelry, too much, or makeup. You couldn't date, you couldn't even hold hands. At least, I mean, the white ones couldn't, right? You get kicked out of these schools if you intermarried, if you if a white person married a black person, you got kicked out. And they saw nothing wrong with that. What happened to thy will, uh, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven? Uh, is there going to be segregation in heaven? And yet they never saw that. See, here's the problem. They measure themselves by we dress a certain way, our hair is cut neat and trim, the girls, you know, set with their legs crossed and, you know, the boy said, yes, sir, and yes, ma'am. And they thought that was righteous. So you imagine yourself by your own goodness, but not by God. John said this, how can you say you love God, but hate the one that's born from God? And yes, the coloreds, <laughs> the black people who were born again, that you shun, forbid to, to let in your churches. How can you say you were born of God? John says you're a liar. So just because they said, because they measured themselves by the strict guidelines of their dress code, of their rules, it was nothing more but mere religion, no more than what the Pharisees practiced. You see, when you really got down to it, what was the greatest command? Love your brother. And how can you say as a white person that you 
didn't think we were valuable enough to mix with. How can you then retaliate black person by saying I hate white people because of how they treat me? God says, love your brother. So you see this idea of sin here. We, we measure sin because, you know, um, as one pastor said uh, many years ago, sin is what you do and I don't. But God says you, it, 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 it's all ra filthy rags to me. So we start off with, we start off with all are under sin. So this is how God looks at mankind. He's dead in sin. There's no one good. Now look at verse 19. He says, now we know that whatever the law says, now notice he's you're going to see a lot of emphasis on the law. Now what I'm going to do also, I'm going to go through this and I'm going to take the time to define a lot of words here because it's important that these words, um, um, they, they kind of, we have a cognitive um, a meaning of this, understand that we, we, we grasp it here. So when he says, now, whatever the law says, he says, speak to those who are subject to the law so that every mouth may be shut, 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 and that the whole world may become subject to God's judgment. For no one would be justified in his sight by the works of the law, because the knowledge of sin comes through the law. <clears throat> that is what the law produces. That is not, the law does not produce goodness in you. The law does not produce righteousness in you. Why? It's not designed to. It's, it's not, and the reason why it's not designed to because there's you cannot produce goodness in someone who is dead in sin. Someone who is dead in sin. So, um, now he says, so, so, um, now, so let me say the law again. So the law, which goes back to, but not limited to the law of Moses. And as scripture says, the law was given to an unrighteous man. And notice he says, the law is the knowledge of sin. That's what the law does. And it's every command to do right. It is every command. So for example, because again, let's go back to this hypocrisy that we have, where we say we're okay with God. We're, we're okay with God. Okay, we are okay with God. And God says, no, you're not. Let me give you an example. We understand thou shalt not kill. We got that one. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Even though people do, we, we know it's wrong. Un we know it's wrong, right? We know those kinds of sins are wrong. But for example, in the book, in, in, in the law of Moses, he says, if you see your brother's ox wander, gets lost, and he wanders off, you happen to be out sitting on your porch, and you say, oh, there's someone's ox that's lost. Here's what the law says. Here's what the law commands. And by the way, remember, so the commands are always, if you don't do the commands, that's a sin. Let's keep that in mind. So the law commands, if you see your brother whose ox has wandered off and has gotten lost. Or your neighbor, okay, actually your neighbors, okay, it used, I think they use the term neighbor. The reason why that's important because anyone within the nation of Israel was a neighbor, was a neighbor anyone. So he says, see your brother's ox wander off. He says, you have to go and grab the ox and bring it in. Keep it, you know, bring it into your barn, right, whatever. Keep it until your neighbor comes looking for it. And when he comes looking for it, you ought to return it to him. Okay? You ought to return it to him. That was a command. 
Now, suppose somebody is sitting down and they go, okay, there's somebody's ox wandering away. And I'm going to go inside. I'm like, I don't want to be bothered. I don't want to be bothered. You've just broken the command. You've just sinned. See, you just sinned. And, and just so you know, remember, all Adam did was ate fruit. That's all he did. He ate fruit. He didn't blaspheme. He didn't kill. He didn't commit adultery. He didn't, you know, there was no other uh, women around, so he couldn't commit adultery. But bestiality, he didn't offer blood sacrifice to Moloch. He ate fruit. So the one thing is, what was the consequences of that? But to God, it was still sin. He said, don't do it. God didn't say, oh, okay, Adam, I got you. You messed up. We all do. No, he died spiritually. So that's the law, though. So in, when you break the law, and, and keep this in mind, Jesus even up the ante, right? So now when we think about God, let's go back to this, that there is no one <laughs> righteous, not even one. There is no one to understand. There is no one who sees God. All have turned away, right? All have become useless. Jesus ups the ante, right? Because, see, if you are a Pharisee, you tried to be slick. Well, you know, I did not commit fornication. No intercourse. Can you imagine if Pharisees were to living today? Maybe they would use the little gloves that we all use, Right? And then you go, well, see, technically, I didn't touch her. Okay? Um, or maybe I withheld good. To remember, to withhold good is evil, is sin. But Jesus up to Annie, see, that's what he said. He up to Annie, he goes, if you look on a woman to lust after her, you've committed adultery. Why? Because right here, there is, no, there is none righteous, no, not one. So he, uh, so that's just why I'm saying, we're sinners, hopelessly lost in our sins. So when we think we're doing good, you are always violating God's law. You are never measuring up, because God will judge the very intent of our heart, the very deep thoughts that we have. We fail before God. So let that sink in. Now he says, verse 19 again, now we know that whatever the law said to speak to those who are subject to the law and everyone is because we're all unrighteous. So that every mouth may be shut and the whole world may become subject to God's judgment. This is why God set his bar so high that we could never reach it. Why? That we may be subject to God's judgment. And now he goes on and he says, for no one would be justified in his sight by the works of the law because the knowledge of sin comes through the law. So the only thing that comes through the law is sin. Now let's define some words and then I'm going to come back and go through this again, but let's define some words. So the first word, we already talked about the law, okay? Obviously, judgment then is the rendering of God's justice, the pronouncement of God's justice, the conclusion. And we all fail at the judgment. We're subject to God's judgment, which would be wrath. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, the word justify is a very interesting word because the word just, justify, they, they kind of come to the same group of words. It is the legal process of being made right. And that's very important right there. When we talk about Jesus dying on the cross, we never ever talk about God sweeping our sin away. Let me give you an example. Give you an example. 
You see this sometimes on television. You will have a child commit a horrible crime. And then the parent may say, I'll go to jail. Don't you say anything, but I'll go to jail. Well, you know why that's wrong? It's because there was no justice done. In other words, how does the child then, how, how, how are they justified? So remember we're talking about the legal side, the um, um, justice side of being saved. For no one would be justified in his sight, right? So the word the, the, to justify, okay? So if you look at the word just, a just is a person that is right. So justify, and, 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 and this is important, Justify is the legal way of making someone right. Now, I'm going to use an old case, very famous case that still to this day sparks great debate. And that is the OJ right trial. And they called it the trial of the century. And why was it the trial of the century? Uh, race, okay, but, you know, on both sides, right, race on both sides. Um, and what was interesting, because you had a lot of people on both sides, black people, there were some black people that he's innocent, why? Because the white man is guilty. And then whites were saying he was guilty, why? Because he's black, <laughs> right? And so the trial, he's, he, he, he was accused in charge of, of murder. And then he went through the trial and he was found, he was acquitted. Now, you can go back and forth with that. I'm going to tell you that, you know, um, if you listen to the evidence that was presented, then um, you, you would have to say that the jury came to a fair um, decision. Now, if people don't like the decision, and that's usually what the arguments are based upon on both sides. But so legally then, he was justified, he was made right. Now, once he was acquitted, he could turn around and say, <laughs> I did it, and he would never have to be acquitted, I mean, judge for that again. But that's not how God's justice works. See, remember, we start off guilty. Uh, our Constitution says we start off presumed innocent. But God is, no, no, you're guilty. And then so God's justice is the legal process to make us right according to his standards. Remember those, those high standards. The high perfection, that's God's standards. That's what justify means. And at the end of the process, you are just. You have you are right. Okay? Now I kind of talked about sin too. So I'm not gonna really go over that, but sin, of course, is God's violating God's standard, violating God's rules, his commandments. And by the way, that sin goes on. We start with that we are sinners. And then we go on to the fact that because we are sinners, we sin out of our nature. Okay? And when he says the works of the law, by the way, that works of the law is contaminated every denomination. Every denomination is contaminated by works. That most of Christianity, as well as other religions, but most of Christianity believes in some form or fashion that they must do some kind of good works. Some kind of good works. Okay? 
So um, when he says that no one would be made right, this just uh, in his sight by the works of the law. No one will be made right. You cannot be legally made right by the works of the law. Now we showed you why, in the, right? That you, first of all, it's impossible for you to live according to those standards. But notice this, for no one will be made, will be justified in his sight by the works of the law. I like that term sight. So, uh, let's do this. Let me go to Colossians and let me show you what site then can we go by. All right. Um, and let me do this too. I want to just to show you. All right. Um, all right. That's not what I wanted here. I'm going to a translation. I should have went here. I want you to see it. I want to compare the two um, uh, verses. And uh, where they at? I think uh, here we go. Um, all right. Uh, I think we can do it here. All right. So look at this. I'm going to use the New King James Version here. It said that you were once alienated and enemies in your mind, but we can work it now. He has reconciled you in his body of his flesh through death to present you holy, blameless, and above reproach. Now get this, in his sight. So the only way in God's sight that you can be justified is by what Jesus done or what Jesus has done. Okay. So, um, and he says that you may be, um, for no one, verse 20, for no one would be justified in, in his sight by the works of the law. We can also add by doing good deeds, by doing good works, by living right. Why? Because that's what the law prescribes. So in his sight, you can never live up to that. Why? Because remember, he's going to judge the intent of your heart. He's going, he's going to judge your thoughts, right? In other words, what if God was to take your thoughts and as, as like a, as a projector, project them on there? Lord, no, right? Um, but God sees it. Understand that. That's why, again, we could never be right. So then, so the word justify is then the legal process of being right. Now, I'm going to pick this up next time. And I'm going to, again, I'm going to go through here with Romans 3. Because what we see in Romans 3 is the legal description of our salvation. The legal description of our salvation. So I'll pick this up next time uh, in part 17. So um, don't forget to like and share this video and subscribe to BP to Bible Perspective. And as always, if you have a thought or comment, add it to the comments section below. All comments are welcome. And I will see you in part 17.